Good morning, everybody, and welcome to our installment of Consultants Corner. This is actually a non-hostile takeover to talk about how to apply to the recently opened Securing Communities Against Hate Crimes grant. Uh, we'll be led today through it by David Pollack, our chair of CSI, and members of our team, including Jeremy Paulson, who, who is our cyber specialist. For those of you who are just signing on for this how-to training, this is our regular time slot for Consultants Corner every first and third Tuesday of the month, which is really usually talking about the post-award side. So those of you who have received a grant or for those of you who are applying in hopes of receiving a, a grant and want help in the future about how to navigate the rules, because yeah, there's a lot of work on the front end, which we're gonna talk about today. But then if you're awarded the grant, there's a lot of procurement and contractual rules you must follow uh, as you bring on your vendors and do your security projects. So this is our usual time for the consultant's corner. Keep an ear out. Uh, we'd hope to see you there, especially if you do have some grants in progress. But without further ado, and to get right to the point, I'm going to turn it over to David. So thank you and good morning. Thank you so much, Dove. As Dove said, this is uh, recently uh, released and the governor uh, extended the deadline the deadline will be February 28th, 2023. Let's take it away from here. First, I want to talk a little bit about uh, the Community Security Initiative, or CSI. We've been in business for a little bit more than two and a half years. Our anniversary is, is in February. We cover uh, New York City, Long Island, and Westchester. And we do a lot of different things, tracking threats, including uh, we have two incredible uh, intel analysts that deal with the deep and the dark web, the rest of uh, social media and, and the open web. And you can uh, probably see that you probably know that uh, three weeks ago we picked up the threat that uh, against New York synagogues. And we uh, saw something, we said something to the FBI and NYPD, and the suspects were uh, arrested, and one is in jail and one is on bail. We track threats, we respond to anti-Semitic incidents, we talk about physical security of all institutions, we provide training at no cost to your institutions. So before you apply for training in this grant, talk to your regional security director. We, that's a new title that everyone's getting. We have six uh, regional security directors and see if they can provide the training at no cost. We have incredible, uh, incredibly good trainers. All of our team is certified in active threat. We, we talk about general security awareness, a lot of different things. Of course, we assist with federal and state grants. We help you connect with uh, law enforcement, and we do notifications. This is what our lawyers tell us we have to do, which is, hey, we're, we're trying to do the best we can, give you the best advice we can, but you're responsible for reading what the state puts out and really uh, interpreting it. You know, we do our best. This is the uh, request for proposals that you can download. Here's the uh, link right here. Uh, truth be told, you're going to have some questions that we can't answer because some of the uh, verbiage in the uh, request for proposals is not totally clear. You know, we're doing our best to get answers. Uh, there's a very formal process to uh, get those answers. This is to fund safety and security projects at nonprofits at risk of hate crimes. Every Jewish organization is at risk of hate crimes. There's approximately $50 million available. Uh, hate crimes are very broadly defined. A uh, hate crime can uh, be a crime that is motivated uh, because of a belief about a person's race, ethnicity, sex, sexual orientation, religion, or other characteristics as defined by state law. Okay. Uh, the applications are due by noon on Tuesday, February 28th. So if you try to submit it at one o'clock that day, uh, good luck. Approximately $50 million, that translates into a thousand projects and uh, uh, $50,000 uh, per project. And you can submit up to three applications. This is the most confusing piece of it. We don't know what a pro exactly what they define as a project and what they define as an application. 
Last year, you could do up to three facilities. So if you had three, billion, uh, three buildings on your property, you could apply for those three buildings. They have dropped the word facility in general. Uh, so we think that you could do a project. We think that a project means that you could replace your main doors project as project one, your secondary doors as project two, and put blast mitigation film on your windows as project three. That's something uh, that we, that's our theory, but we're waiting for clarity. Uh, this is new, and you're going to hear more about this later. Uh, you can submit an application, a fourth application for cybersecurity. You get two years to do this. Okay, who's eligible? You must be all eligible. Uh, you must qualify uh, with all of these criteria. Uh, you must be tax exempt. Now, if you are a synagogue, or any other house of worship, you are automatically exempt and you don't need to go through formal uh, IRS recognition of that exemption. But, uh, and you can self-certify by pro providing a letter. You must be a nonprofit. You, that means you have to be incorporated under either the Nonprofit Corporation Act or the Religious Corporation Act in New York State. You must be at risk of a hate crime or attack. We'll go into that later. You ha must have uh, be registered as a charity. Now, what does that mean? Uh, you'll see a lot of different uh, references to confusing forms. And I've notified the state that they're, you know, this has to be updated. The Charities Bureau now allows you to register online. Again, if you're a religious corporation, all you have to do is to give them your, you know, essentially your name and some contact information, and then they can, and that you're a, um, a a religious corporation, and then you're exempt. Otherwise, if you're a health organization, for example, a nonprofit health organization, you have to register and annually submit information to the Charities Bureau of the Attorney General's office, and you must be pre-qualified. Uh, and we'll go into that in a minute. So what can you buy? Lighting, door hardening, uh, locking, alarm systems, uh, camera-based security systems, video they're called video surveillance systems these days, access control systems, perimeter fencing, barriers, bollards, Blast resistant film for your windows, interior door hardening, and panic buttons, lockdown systems, and public address systems. All of these are important. And what else is eligible to purchase? Security training costs. We'll go with, over that in a second. And cybersecurity. And now that we're going into cybersecurity, I want to hand the baton over to Jeremy Paulson, Paulson our cybersecurity specialist. Thank you, David. Put it simply, um, cyber risk is real. Cyber risk is something that everybody faces. It's potential risk to Jewish organizations, and this has actually happened. Website defacement, hijacking organizational websites to display Nazi and anti-Semitic imagery, successful ransomware attacks. We've had several of these in the tri-state area. Phishing attacks, attempting to divert funds and steal credentials and attacks do damage your operations very severely. You can have loss of operating and financial data. You can have an exposure of your donors and members to identity theft, possible harassment, or frankly, even worse. And by that, I am talking about her, perhaps kinetic events. This is the first time this has ever been open to cyber ever. And the amount of money that they are offering is, to put it mildly, incredible. $50,000 for a project to improve an organization's, organization's cybersecurity. And here's another one. Eligible costs include, but are not limited to, the following. Planning, 
costs associated with, associated with development of cybersecurity plans, including the hiring of consultants, equipment, software packages, firewalls, antivirus applications, malware protection, and this also extends into network equipment, equipment including servers, firewalls, even individual computers, theoretically, intrusion detection systems, and hardware components that provide protection against cyber threats. Training, costs associated associated with the development and delivery of cyber awareness training to staff at the user level. This would also include things like phishing simulation programs that keep your people on their toes so they don't just snore through a 15 minute presentation and forget it. Exercises, costs associated with the design, development, execution and evaluation of exercises to determine the viability of new or pre-existing cybersecurity capabilities. Okay, uh, Jeremy, you want to when you go into an organization, mm -hmm. you want to say you know tell us what you're doing, what you're looking for, and how how you advise them. Okay, my job when I go in, and you guys need this assessment. It's called a cybersecurity self-assessment, and I go in, and I basically dissect your network find the vulnerabilities, highlight them, and make recommendations, which you will then addend onto your application. This is something you really do need. By the way, in terms of this cost, a question that I have and we, we've asked the state is a lot of this, um, you know, first of all, cybersecurity is not necessarily a one undone. You purchase a piece of equipment and it's good forever. No, it really uh, isn't. If I can interrupt, I, David. Uh, there is, uh, you know, essentially there are, you know, at least annual licenses to, you know, for all of this kind of equipment. You know, we want to know how much uh, the state will pay for in, in terms of the annual licenses, uh, licensing, you know, of, your, of the software. And, you know, the other uh, question is, uh, Jeremy and I have debated this. You can put your uh, servers in the cloud. The advantage of doing it in the cloud is that then there are supposedly you're paying for full-time people to make sure that everything is up to date because your uh, system can be good to today and tomorrow uh, they find a uh, magic way to intrude and you'll be vulnerable again. Uh, you have to update it. Uh, you can put your servers in the cloud. You should be keeping uh, backups in the cloud because what happens, you have a wonderful server, a perfect backup system, and what happens if there's a fire or a flood? The equipment is ruined. So, you know, those are the kinds of things that we want to know. Will this grant pay for also? Uh, anything else on this, Jeremy? I think you covered a lot. I want to reinforce the point that this has never before been available. This has been a situation where previously, I think it was on the federal grants, they would allow some amount for backup systems, but this covers everything. If you have no firewall, this is an opportunity to get a firewall. If your servers are running obsolete equipment or obsolete operating systems, this is an opportunity to get that stuff upgraded. And I believe, unless I'm wrong, that you can also use, apply this to managed service providers and their fees. I may be wrong about this. Well, it uh, can do planning and, and training. Right. And, you know, it depends on what. And as Jeremy goes in and, and does a survey, and Jeremy uh, is a service provided by CSI at no cost to your organization. And he'll prov provide the document necessary to submit for this grant. He will explain what you need. Uh, phrases such as firewall sound like gibberish to you. Jeremy will explain them yep. and explain what, what it's really protecting against. So thanks, Jeremy. You're welcome. Now, now we're going into non-permissible costs. And, you know, uh, first of all, you can't redo a, a project that has been previously funded through the hate crimes grant. 
this is, you know, for example, I uh, just had this conversation yesterday. You know, for example, if you did blast mitigation film on the north side of your building, that means that you can do blast mitigation film on the sa uh, south side of your building. Just make it very, very explicit that this is a, a new project. You can't do anything for facilities not yet built or existing. You know, we get lots of uh, questions. I'm sorry, that's not an option. Uh, personnel costs, including security guard, uh, guards, are not eligible. General use maintenance expenditures, overtime, all kinds of other uh, kinds of things. The uh, grant does not pay for any grant writing costs. Now, for either physical security, physical security grants or the cybersecurity uh, grants, you need an assessment. Our assessments will uh, comply with all uh, requirements. And all you have to do, and you know, we're going to distribute this, follow this link. You just request an assessment. Please, please, please do it early. People who are um, asking for assessments on, uh, on February 14th, we might say, hey, we're already totally booked. We will get to you if you apply in the, the next month. But, you know, we have uh, a lot of capacity. We have a great, great team. And we pull in extra people to do assessments during grant periods. But we only have so much capacity. So please fill out this form. And we'll get back to you really, really soon. Uh, Jamie Matos is uh, on this call, uh, on this uh, webinar with us, and she will get back to you and tell you what your next steps are. Now, how do you apply? So there are two very, very separate applications that you have to use. Two systems. Don't think if you do one, it eliminates the other. You have to do both. One is called Grants Gateway, and that's where you pre-qualify. I'll get to that in a moment. And you do the actual application in the Grants Management System, GMS. Now, you have to register for each of them. But we'll give the links on how to do it and go to the next steps. Okay, you pre-qualify. Two steps. You first have to register your organization online. You have to sign and notarize a, uh, an application that you've downloaded and then scan it and send it to them. And then you go and get pre-qualified. We'll go through that in a second. Again, to do the grants management system, I advise you to download their manual because it really is good. It really does give you a lot of information on, how, on what to do next. Again, pre-qualifications. You're going to go, have to upload forms and answer some questions. Again, we have some information on our website. We'll add the link to this slide. Here is the checklist that we have uh, with the, that they give you of what you have to do. But essentially, you need a certificate of incorporation. If you don't know where your certificate of incorporation is, well, you know, it's uh, you got to find it. You, you need your IRS 501c3 determination letter or uh, a letter that says that you're, you're a house of worship and, and uh, are automatically exempt. IRS 990, religious corporations don't need this. The char 500 or uh, char 410, that's the gobbledygook. That's some gobbledygook that doesn't exist anymore. You go to the Charities Bureau here and you do it online. Uh, you need a board of directors profile. You know, basically the key leadership of your organization and senior leadership resumes. You know, you, you need a list of your board of directors and your bylaws. So all of that has to be uploaded. Uh, and then some uh, audit reviews and findings. Those of you that don't have formal audits, you can do a financial statement. Uh, we have more help for this on, on our website on how to do it, especially if you're a religious corporation. But start now.
Do not wait because very, very few people get it right the first time. Upload everything and answer every question that, that they're required to a- answer. So if you're doing it now, you will be pre-qualified for this grant and the federal grant, and it will be in the spring, and you'll be in good shape. I know people who call me and the day before, or, or even the week before the due date, which is February 28th, and say, oh, I just tried to submit and it says I, I'm not pre, I, I'm pre-qualified. I need to pre-qualify. How do I do it? And I say, it's too late. You know, it can't be processed that soon. Do it now. You, you'll have much less stress la- later. There's lots of help available. The pre-qualification people have a webinar every Thursday. Send any uh, questions into us. GMS, I often wonder why bureaucracy is bureaucracy. GMS is the application which actually uh, submit on. And there's lots and lots of pieces of that. Many of those pieces you have to type into GMS and put it on a Word document. You have to do both. It's redundant. It's a pain in the what, whatever. But please do it. A lot of this, if you don't do what they ask you to do, you will be disqualified. And you can have a perfect uh, application. If you're not pre-qualified, they will uh, disqualify you. We'll get into that later. Now, the meat of the application are the questions. And we'll go over those questions right now. In total, you can get 100 points plus five bonus points if you haven't ever gotten a a hate crimes grant before. Applicants must obtain a minimum proposal score of 70 points to be eligible for funding. We predict that anyone who submits a complete application and does a little bit of work and listens to us, anyone who, uh, who gets 70 points will get a grant. You don't need 100 on this. But It says all questions, including subsections and those which have no point value, must be answered. Now, there are some uh, answers are, they tell you in the RFP, you have to put an NA on, non-applicable. If you just leave it blank, don't put your NA in. Do they disqualify you? I don't know, but don't chance it. You know, follow directions. Okay, so... What's the first section? Has no points, but if you don't answer it, you get disqualified. First question is, what are you? It's just checking it off. That You have to submit your mission statement. The mission statement does not have to be fancy. It, it can be provide religious services in the Orthodox or the conservative or the Reformed tradition. Lots of organizations go through, you know, a whole strategic planning mission statement process. And, you know, that's fine. Uh, They will use this to help them determine that you are at risk. You know, if you say Jewish tradition, Orthodox Jewish tradition, or secular Jewish tradition, that puts you in the right category that you're at risk. You have to provide a narrative to describe the nonprofit organization Uh, that includes the size of membership, the number of people served, the community served, primary use of the facility. It could be prayer and classes, you know, whatever whatever you do do, days and hours of operation and your peak occupancy. This gives them the snapshot. By the way, when CSI provides a uh, is asked to do an assessment and we will provide you with one we answer all these questions and you can cut and paste from what we give you and then describe your organization's risk of a hate crime based on its ideology excuse me ideology beliefs or missions what what is it for example Any institution that adheres to Jewish beliefs or whose mission is to support Jewish individuals, causes, or religious life is at heightened risk of being targeted uh, in a hate attack. 
So that's this is language you can hang your hat on. Use the National Threat Advisory Bulletin from last week. This is a, a joint product of the FBI, Homeland Security, and the Secret Service. But recent incidents have highlighted the enduring threat to faith-based communities, including the Jewish uh, community. And then they talk about the New Jersey threat. They don't talk about specifically the New York threat because it, I assume it was uh, too late. And then they, a couple weeks ago, uh, FBI Director Christopher Wray observed, um, but it demonstrates the tragic reality that the Jewish community uniquely ends up on the receiving end of hate-fueled attacks from all sides. And I'd venture to say that no community feels more threatened by that boiling over into violence than yours. These are things that the very sobering statements, but these are things that can go into your application and boom, you're at risk of a hate crime. Any symbolic value of, of your site, is your site a landmark? Do you have prominent leaders or members? Include any other fact that might bring unwanted attention to your site. Truth be told, not everyone has symbolic value. You don't get disqualified. But, you know, what I would do, for example, I would just put in something. We have a school uh, with 100 students. And our school is critical for th those families, critical to those families who rely on us for their education. Put that in. You've satisfied it. You haven't left it blank and uh, you qualify. Talking about at risk, uh, this has been prominently in the news. NYPD just uh, released hate crime statistics for 2022. In November 2022, uh, anti-Jewish incidents are up from 20 in November last year to 45 this year, 125% uh, increase now. These data are available from the NYPD hate crimes uh, dashboard. And if you are in New York, you can get data for your precinct. So that kind of really establishes why you're at risk. This is the vulnerability as assessment. Now, I, you, you have a choice of using their tool or requesting uh, us to come in and do it. If you really believe in self-abuse, you can use their tool, or you can schedule CSI Start Now, click on this link, and Jamie will be in touch with you, and we will get you set up for a uh, an assessment. And our assessments can be used as long as it's current and reflects the current vulnerabilities of the facility. Uh, if we did one in 2020, CSI, you have one from CSI in 2020, you know, essentially what you have to do is update it. Let's say that you got a grant since 2020, and there were certain vulnerabilities that you addressed in a federal or state grant. Your assessment has to be updated and say, well, we said that we had terrible doors in 2020, but, you know, we're installing new doors based on uh, in our grant, and this vulnerability will be mitigated. The uh, other thing is the threat levels change, and we have information. Again, uh, contact the, your regional security director, and they can provide you with our most up-to-date security uh, threat profile. Now there are questions six through 10. Question six is, is there a history of hate crimes at the facility or cyber attacks to the organization? Dealing with uh, that's a history of hate crimes, location. Uh, and then just this is probably the toughest um, or, or most intensive question. How will the proposed uh, equipment or training mitigate the identified threats? This is a number of events at the facility per year. You know, you have to explain, again, how your building is used. If you're a school, our building is used Sunday through Friday for classes. And uh, on uh, Shabbat and holidays, we, we have services. You know, and therefore, they want a number of events 
So, you know, you can uh, say, uh, you know, 365 uh, events daily, you know, put in a number. Uh, if you have special events, put in, add that number. You can get zero to five points that usually, they don't tell us as the feds do, how they uh, decide is it zero to five. But my general thought is that the more a building is used, you know, as opposed, you know, a school that's used every day uh, gets more points rather than a, you know, a building that's used once a week or once a month. Uh, largest event attendance in the facility, they don't tell us they probably have some sort of break off. If you have a, uh, you know, a small synagogue with 75 uh, congregants a week is different than a synagogue with a thousand. And this is largest. So, you know, there are lots of synagogues that have thousands of people on the high holidays. And what's the average day, daily population at the facility? Again, these are all kinds of things that you have to think about and answer. Now, question 10 is not really a question. I don't understand why you have to do anything, but you're required to enter N slash A for 10A and 10B. A is the number of reported hate crimes incidents for the county. And that's something that if you look in the appendices of the RFP, you'll see a reported hate crime incidents for, account, for, for county, and it will tell you how many points they assign. So that Brooklyn and other large counties get five points, smaller upstate counties get less. Uh, Rockland uh, does get uh, everything in New York City, Nassau, Suffolk, and uh, Rockland get five, and county population size. History of hate crimes at the facility. Now, not a, everyone has a history of uh, hate crime incident. If you do supply a narrative, describe what happened, it could be that we received a phone threat. Uh, we received an email threat. Submit a narrative report uh, in question six, an evangelism, mail, email, social media, or other threat. You know, and that, that includes in person, there have been cases where people shout outside a uh, synagogue or school. We have incidents outside a school in Brooklyn where people shouted free Palestine. That's something that you can report. If there was something on social media, you know, do a screenshot and submit it. And again, if there is nothing, just say uh, our organization has not uh, personally experienced a hate crime, but there have been uh, many known, known uh, incidents in the area. Again, you know, probably you, you don't get any points if you haven't had any. If you had a lot or serious ones, you get three. But again, all you have to do is to get to 70. You don't have to get to, hunt to 100. Location. If your building is on a prominent block with lots of traffic, say so. If you have unique architecture, say so. If you have signage like Hebrew letters on your building, say so. If uh, your sign says, you know, Rabbi so and so, say so. That's something that the location does single out your uh, building and describe the uh, proposed hardening equipment and how it will mitigate it. You know, here's an example that, I, that we used. Thank you, Dove. Your vulnerability, you know, comes from our vulnerability, vulnerability uh, assessment that the main entry door is not forced entry resistant. That means that someone can kind of take a crowbar and just get in. The threat, an adversary wishing to do damage ranging from vandalism to assaults could easily enter the building. So those are the threats. And there are multiple threats for every um, vulnerability. Our recommendation was that the primary entrance door and its framing hardware and locking system should be replaced or modified to uh, resist forced entry. And the mitigation, and this is how you explain how it will help, because that's what they want to know. Do you know what this will do to make you safer?
and more secure. This upgrade will provide a physical barrier from an uh, attacker to deny or delay access, th thereby mitigating damage should access be attained. Again, these are different kinds of uh, threats. You know, active shooter, graffiti, homemade explosives, straight edge weapons and knives, and vehicle ramming. And all of these kinds of threats can be mitigated. And here's some more information. I'm not going to go through everything right now. Attendance measures. The greater the number, the higher the score. Here are the demographics. The budget. You're going to have to put in a budget. Uh, again, your regional security director can get you some numbers for any, you know, estimates for anything. No one knows everything that's needed, you know, the exact cost, because it depends on your building. But, you know, we know that an average uh, camera uh, placement costs X, including installation. We can help you fill in the blanks. And here are the rules that has to be complete and provide sufficient detail to justify expenditure. It must also be reasonable and appropriate. If you say that we're assumed that this is going to be $6,000 per camera, the people reading this say, hey, what are they getting, gold-plated cameras? You know, you don't want to do that. You want to kind of give people reasonable estimates, and we try to uh, help you with that. You'll see that the budget detail has things that are not applicable. You cannot do personal services. You cannot do fringe benefits. Just skip this. Training. Here's some information on training costs. They have to be approved beforehand. And again, I said this before, CSI will provide training in many relevant areas at no cost to your organization. Everyone should have active threat training for all of your constituencies. Our regional security uh, directors or our training specialists are glad to step in and do this training for you. And if I may say, they're really, really good. Uh, consultants, the same thing. You know, uh, there's some rules involved. Here's an example of how to do it. And a sample of the budget detail worksheet. You know, again, I have exterior CC cameras. We need six of them. Approximate cost per item is 2,500, including installation. So six times 2,500 is 15,000. The justification, expand the existing camera system. They'll be installed to monitor the perimeter of the building and property and exterior access points. Uh, it talks about the kind of cameras we want. Uh, analytic capability. Analytics, uh, by the way, cameras can be very, very smart these days. So that if uh, someone comes into your parking lot at you know nine o'clock at night, you can set your system to send you a notification. There's someone in the uh, parking lot and it gives you a snippet of the car that's in the parking lot. And you can look at it and say, oh, well, the rabbi must have had to do something that night, you know, and went into the building or I don't know that car, you know, maybe we should ask the police to swing by. So all of that, you know, uh, your cameras can do that for you. And again, your regional security directors can really help. Early real-time system notifications maximize the cr critical time required to adequately lock down the facility or intervene in real time in any attempt of graffiti or vandalism. So this is something that we, we're looking at a reasonable cost. We're looking at what we're asking for, and we're telling them what the, the upgrade will do. Procurement method, your procurement method uh, has to be per New York State procurement guidelines. That means, by the way, in case you people have never done this before, that means that you have to get bids, you have to go through a whole process. All of this have to get uh, minority and women business enterprises to bid on this. Technically, 30% of your purchases must be from MWBE. 
organizations, and Dov and Jamie will be there to go over all of the details because, you know, you get the, these grants, you're going to need lots of help. And this is a plug for Consultants Corner, which goes over a lot of these uh, uh, details in you know, and gives specifics. It, it's really, really helpful. And, you know, Dov and Ilya Yamansky, our other key cons uh, our co-host at Consultants Corner, go over so many things, not only what are the state rules, but again, what's best practice? How can you get the most for your money? Because, you know, as Jeremy said, this is a lot of money, 50,000 for cybersecurity, but you got to spend it right. And all too often there are consultants and vendors out there who have their own interests in mind more than your organization's interests. We want you to get the biggest bang for the buck. Again, there's supplies here, travel and sustenance, Etc. There's a best practice guide uh, in the RFP and, and a guide for the budget detail. Uh, then it asks for the budget totals. This is fifty thousand per project. Again, we admit we don't know exactly what a project is, and then we have to go through project completion, which is, are you going to get? <laughs> Get done in ten uh, in two years. Uh, talk about uh, you've done these kind of projects before. You've done capital projects. We're good at it. So and so has done this before, or we have board members that help us with. Uh, you know, we have board members who are uh, real estate managers, so they know how to do this. Or we have accountants, or you know, lawyers or engineers that can help us push the project forward. And then comment, they know who we are. The criminal justice services people know who we are and say we're working with CSI. The, all of this will help. The biggest turtle is if you have a previous grant and it, you didn't finish it, you have to explain why and how you're going to do better this time. Again, zero to five points. You need a project uh, work plan. This is something that you have to follow. There's a standardized uh, work plan in the RFP on page 41. Go through it. And then again, as I mentioned, there's a bonus question, which is, did you ever receive a, a grant award from, I'm sorry, this is wrong from DHSES or DCJS? It, it from either. So how do they score it? Number one, there's a tier one evaluation, and these are pass fail. So are you pre-qualified? Yes, you pass. You know, go on to the next step. If you're not uh, pre-qualified, you fail. You you are disqualified from the uh, grant. So. The, these are the kind of things. And then tier two, they review and score your uh, responses. Usually what they do is they have two people do it. It doesn't uh, rely on only one person. Applicants must attain a minimum proposal score of 70 points to be eligible. And we predict, we don't guarantee, but we predict that anyone getting the 70 will get a grant. Tier three, for some reason, their executive staff makes the decisions. Uh, I assume they'll go with the score, but you know, again, they reserve the right to do anything that they want. Again, what do you have to do? You need a Dunn's number. Even if you got an, uh, a unique uh, entity qual uh, identifier or a UEI for the federal grant, you still need a Dunn's number. Here's how to do it for free. Again, start early. You need to be pre-qualified. You need uh, a status history that shows that you're pre-qualified. You need to be in the GMS system. And within the GMS system, you complete all the necessary contractual requirements. You complete tier one and tier two of evaluation requirements. Answer project narrative questions. 
and attach the answers in a Word document. You put it all in GMS, you don't do the Word document, uh, you're disqualified. Uh, you have to complete the budget tab on GMS. You have to do a work plan and, and all this counts for each one of the uh, projects that you're uh, talking about, whether it be physical security or cybersecurity, you have to attach a, 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 an assessment. You have to attach a ground color, ground level photo of the front facade of the facility or recreational, uh, recreational uh, area, close enough to show the location, but far enough away to show the immediate surroundings. So you wanna kind of, stand across the street and get a photo. Uh, and then you have to do, for cybersecurity, you need a cyber assessment, which um, Jeremy will provide. And now I'm gonna take a drink of something and uh, turn it over to, uh, who is it? Seth or Dove for questions. It's gonna be uh, both of us. Thank you, David. Uh, definitely a lot of information. Uh, for those of you new to the applications, um, you know, like David said, this, the, the move is to get started and take it step by step. So right now we're going to go through some of the questions. Uh, I'm sure most of them were answered through David's uh, discussion. There are some areas that are still uh, not totally clear from the state and we'll give our best interpretation. Remember, again, we are the Community Security Initiative, part of JCRC, and we're giving our best guidance. We do not speak for DCJS or the other state agencies uh, that provide this grant. So to start with, there were a lot of questions about eligibility in terms of if I'm not in the building or I'm moving into it soon, or our building burnt down and we moved out temporarily. So, some of this I think we can address as it's directly in the RFP and DCJS's request for proposal, but David, you want to give any more clarity there? I, I, I think that's something that's best. Uh, that you, you can ask a question and, you know, contact us uh, as to how to submit the questions. It's in the RFP, how to submit a question. My general rule of thumb is if you have a certificate of occupancy, th that's a sign even though you haven't completed your move. Remember, this is going to be submitted in February. So it doesn't mean, you know, if you're still in process now and you're done by February or mostly done, that, you know, you can argue that. They don't have any uh, way, you know, the reality is they don't check if you're, using, you know, 100% in the building yet on February 28th but they will audit it at some point. And if you're not in the building, they will, uh, you know, you win, you're not in the building, you're gonna be disqualified. I'll, I'll add this. The intent of the RFP definitely makes it seem like you should be in the building at time of application, but 100% you need to be there by the time of award. Uh, what David was saying, if you pull up the RFP and if Seth, if you could post that link again, you'll notice, and this is one of the reasons we rescheduled this training to today, uh, you'll notice that the state DCJS, that's the agency implementing this grant, Division of Criminal Justice Services, they um, are taking questions. So if you have a very, very, very specific question, we obviously don't know every nitty gritty answer, especially because DCJS, this is only their second time being involved with this grant. That's the old RFP, but um, they can, they will take questions uh, at, to, to a web, to an email address. I think it's right there. If you see DCJS funding at dcjs.ny.gov, and they're gonna be posting those. Those are due tomorrow night, those questions, and uh, to the state, and they'll respond within a couple of weeks. That will give us, you know, everyone here, exact clarity on your specific situation. Obviously, we don't know every specific example. Um, but again, the, the intent is definitely that you should be occupying the building, that building should exist. So if you, if you have a little bit of a gray area, um, definitely ask. There was also a question about the Thursday pre-qualification webinars. Those are not our webinars, those are from the state. I'm putting a link in the chat right now to the pre-qualification website under grants management. There is a link to the, the trainings that they do. All right, ne next question. Um, 
and I think we definitely need some clarity here. And this is one of the areas that David mentioned. We don't have a lot of 100% clarity. We know you can submit for up to three projects, and there's also the allowance for cyber. So we are, what, what is that cyber application? Is that part of those three or is that additional? That's number four. That's an additional thing. So you can get up to $200,000. Right. That, that's our reading of this RFP. I'm sure there's going to be many questions posted to DCJS. So definitely make sure you're uh, getting notifications from DCJS when they put out their uh, Q and A's or uh, you know the frequently yeah. asked questions. And and we we will distribute their Q and A when they are uh, when they come out. Right. So on, on that note, and this is going to be that si a similar answer. There was a question: Should we do multiple project multiple? hardware installations under one project of a 50 grand bucket or should we apply for three separate if we're doing you know gates doors and cameras and and my answer is it's logical you can do multiples for 50,000 if you only need 50,000 or you know some projects for uh, application 1 and other projects for application 2 i just don't know uh again this is something that we have asked yeah yep so we hope to get clarity there um all right this is actually a great question where csi can be support um we're a small small institution how are we supposed to do all this work and i, I know we have a lot of resources david will explain but i'm going to give you a major caveat that that david has mentioned as well there's a lot of work on the back end too that's why we started these you know, every other week, consultants corner webinars. It's why our regional security managers assist you navigate the grant. There's a lot of work post award as well. But that being said, we're a small institution. How do we navigate all, all this paperwork and application requirement? One of the things that we can, uh, I, I did not mention here, is that CSI does have some funding available to help you uh, retain a grant writer. We will do grants of up to $2,500 for organizations that have never received grants before. What you do is you uh, send a question to security.requests at jcrcny.org and Jamie will get back to you and just say, I want to know more about the grant writers uh, grant. Seth, can you put the address in the chat? You can uh, apply for a grant. We require organizations to be pre-qualified before we reserve a grant for them, but that's just because you have to be able to do at least that much because your grant writer can't find your certificate of incorporation. Right. For example, you're, you're gonna have to do the work to find some of the documentation. Exactly, whether it's utilizing our the available limited funding we have to hire grant writers or you're using consultant and grant writer they're still going to need you to help them get the documentation that the state requires we're going to keep chugging through these questions again this webinar is recorded and will be posted on our consultants corner website within a few days additionally pay attention to the updates from the state but please stick with us we're going to keep going through our questions um, this is another really good question it applies to both both grants i would also advise don't follow the chat box for your answers make sure your answers are coming from a csi representative we can't speak if you get a re an answer in your chat box from someone else in the crowd everyone has a different experience there's lots of little nuances our team is monitoring to make sure we get through pretty much all these questions um here's a good one we're in a historic building or historic district how, how does the grant and what they'll supply support our needs will it provide us upgrades that meet those requirements it will provide if you if you're changing doors and they have to be consistent with the, the historic building and you have to get approval from the landmarks commission or the any the appropriate authorities wherever you are those are the doors you have to do they will go and if you have fifteen thousand dollar doors you know uh that are plain vanilla doors, but, you know, at 25000 to satisfy the landmarks people, they will pay for you $25,000. Uh, they will not necessarily pay for the landmark submissions. Right. So let's reiterate, both these grants 
provide you the funding to navigate the rules that apply to you. If you're a tenant in a building, right, you got to work with your landowner. If you're in a historic district, you got to follow your local governance about following those rules. The the money that's awarded to you, you need to follow those processes. You know, someone mentioned just now about the EHP. It's not that the EHP mandates you follow landmark. It's that they if they're giving you money, they want to make sure that you aren't uh, impacting those landmark rules. So you just need to make sure you show them you are or aren't. And if you are, there's there's ways you work with your landmark building. You make replicable items. You make the doors look exactly like your doors looked already. If you're doing bollards, you make some sort of design, some ar architectural way that still has the appropriate rating uh, of a official type of uh, bollards and vehicle mitigation. But it can look that it makes it fit into your, your architectural style. But that's going to be on you. They're giving you that funding with the with the strict caveat you need to follow those rules. It doesn't mean you can bypass it. It doesn't mean we can ignore it. Um, we're going to keep going. So we talked a lot about David um, the narrative about explaining our threat, explaining the, the our institution's risk. So our Jewish organization is next door to another religious organization. In this case, a, a Muslim organization. Uh, how does that change our narrative for both of our institutions? Maybe they're both applying, they're both eligible. Uh, should we, how do we you know, provide whenever there's other Jewish institutions even nearby? In general, when you're talking about threats, what do we know? Uh, we know that uh, people do look for clusters of, uh, you know, uh, of targets. And so if you're next to a if your synagogue is next to a mosque, um, there are lots of people who hate Muslims and Jews. And uh, having a, you know, th that is worth mentioning that we're next to a mosque and someone could easily target both of our buildings. So, you know, that's the kind of thing. That I, or you can say that on this block, there are four Jewish institutions. That's target something that you should, you should mention. Dov? A target-rich environment. It's definitely, yes. uh, whether it's other, Jew, other Jewish or other anything, a regular school, whatever it may be, definitely impacts your narrative and you should include it. It's another reason we don't advise a strict copy and paste from our materials. This is suggested. We know from both the state and federal level when they see too many very, very similar applications, it, it takes away your individuality. So, uh, you know, use our guidance to write your, your own application. So just to reiterate, there were a couple questions towards the end. The rest are, of our questions are pretty much uh, definitely addressed so far that I've seen in the RFP and from, from the Division of Criminal Justice Services. I would always advise to make sure you still read it. This is our interpretation and our guidance to you. Um, definitely make sure you follow the rules there. Uh, but there was a question, and let's re reiterate this. This was the crux of today's presentation. So if this was your question, please rewatch this we webinar once we post it about the two distinct application systems, right? There's, there's Grants Gateway where you pre-qualify. Once you do that, you are now eligible to apply in the Grants Management System, uh, GMS two separate systems, the state requires both. David, you want to add anything on, on differentiating? I know that was the- No, I, I just start early. Get your grants gateway done this month. By the way, what I forgot to mention is if you pre-qualified last year, it doesn't mean you pre-qualified forever. Some things uh, expire. So remember I said you had to uh, put financial in, uh, information in? That information is good for a year. So if you did it last December, by February, you will no longer be pre-qualified. So check your, pre uh, your document vault and to see if you are still pre-qualified and look at the date that it will expire. All you have to do is to upload it and it will, you know, uh, it will be your information will be reviewed and you'll you'll magically become pre-qualified again right so to reiterate whether you've applied for a previous hate crimes grant that's this we're talking about today the scahc or you applied for the federal 
uh, NSGP, you had to pre-qualify if you're a New York State institution and you need to make sure it's up to date. There are some documents that uh, need refreshers. Um, Seth, I'm gonna rip through a couple questions. Can you post the grant management system link? To clarify, GMS, grant management system, is similar to e-grants if you've applied for other grants with state agencies similar but it is a different system once you're logged in you'll see it's very similar to e-grants but is a distinct system therefore if you have one grant being managed through e-grants and you have another grant being managed through gms you need to use both systems for the individual grants double, um, double headaches yeah the, and and this is bureaucracy double. by the way the governor has decreed okay. that eventually there be a single system but we ain't yet there yet Exactly. <laughs> so you have, you know, if you know how to use e-grants, you're going to have to learn how to use GMS. Gotcha. Um, here, here's a, a couple quick questions. And I'll get back to the chat that I saw. There was a question about costs to, to CSI. We don't charge for any of our services. We're a, uh, you know, a community resource to Jewish organizations in our, you know, the areas we serve. Um, uh, supported by, by UJA Federation. Okay. and run through the Jewish Community Relations Council of New York. Thank you, right. Big, UJA makes this machine run for us. We, our team is growing, right? We had Jeremy on for cyber, if there's any last cyber questions. We have a couple of regional security managers on this call today. Uh, Seth being our Queens regional security manager, who is one of our gurus on the grant. Um, and, you know, if, if the questions isn't addressed here, you can always reach out to your RSMs. Um, Seth had posted the contacts a couple times in the chat. There was questions about cost of security items. That's something we can't necessarily address here. There's too many nuances. What I'll say personally is I, I many play, it's a catch 22, right? We're not supposed to be talking to vendors till we're at the bidding stage uh, with according to the contract, but we wanna understand how much the cost is. Again, this is something we can help you from our team, the RSMs and and myself and our other consultants to get you some general cost estimates. But often I see people, especially for the big ticket items, uh, really put in too little. You know, you want a couple doors. It's so hard to estimate, right? If you have glass in your door and you want bullet resistance level, it's an external historic looking door versus an internal full steel door. There's a range depending on the resistance levels, but you know, we can talk anywhere from six to 12 per door. If it's a double door, it'll be even more, six to 12,000. So, it's something we can't really address on this chat. It's it's too uh, specific, but partner with us and we'll help get you some of the answers. But again, that's why you get your regional security director do your assessment. That way we'll have pictures of what you need in our system and we can get someone to kind of give us a rule of thumb. Gotcha. We're, we're obviously a, a few minutes over. We want to make sure we answer everything. Uh, make sure you see those links posted for grants management system and you know, for, for the two systems you should get started with, you probably won't be up to the cost piece for at least a few weeks. The last question I'm gonna pose here, David, there was questions about, we're struggling getting our DUNS number. I think some of you in your question actually meant the new federal requirement on the federal grant for the UEI. Um, David, if you can just differentiate between the two and what's required for this grant. Right. Last April, the federal government switched from DUNS to sam.gov and it has a UEI, a unique entity identifier. And they were way, way, way behind. We uh, got the federal government to kind of suspend the requirement of a UEI. And now people who won grants are busy getting their UEI. We've been able to help most organizations get their UEI. A DUNS number that system exists. The uh, link to uh, DUNS numbers is there. And if you don't have a DUNS number, you usually get it in two days. It's an automatic system and it's not uh, not onerous. Does this grant require the UEI? No, it only requires the DUNS. That's right. why we put it in there. And that, from our experience, is, is simpler to obtain than the UEI. Uh, hopefully, if you haven't had to deal with it, don't worry about it. David, just talk real quickly about the controller's vendor rep system. I believe the vendor responsibility questionnaire. Not, not for DCJS until you get a grant. Exactly. Thank you. That's why you have to read everything. You exactly. can't assume anything. Gotcha. And um, last question here, and definitely if you have more, we have uh, our, our email to our whole team, or you can reach out to your RSM if, they, if 
Seth, if you can put up the security requests email. Um, but obviously, if you know your RSM, that's a more direct route to your questions. But last question, if you propose a higher expense and the actual expense is lower, what is what happens? It obviously will give you a little bit more allowance to maybe expand the system you're working with, uh, or potentially you could talk to the state about other projects you can use as this fund, funding is allocated to you. Um, it happens, money needs to be shifted around. It's, it's built into the system to be able to allow you to shift funds because we don't know that exact cost. Uh, on that note, David, any other comments? I, I think that's it. We're not going anywhere, we hope. We'll go from there. Shoot us your questions. If you go to jcrc.org slash security and scroll down a little bit, you'll have the contact information for all of our regional security managers. Contact them directly or go to the security requests email and we'll, uh, Jamie will make sure it gets to the right person. On that note, I know the questions are still coming in. And I apologize, but that's why we posted our information because you'll get more questions as you go as well. But for those of you who have received grants or those of you who do receive this grant, we hope to see you on future installments of Consultants Corner. We talk about the backside once you got the award to help you navigate the rules and install uh, you know, quality security programs. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, by the way, I, I just looking at the questions, you know, real quick. Um, your numbers should be reasonable, and we can help you with reasonable numbers. If you can find that you get uh, a better price on doors uh, or CCTV or whatever, that's fine as long as your numbers were reasonable. Coming in high on the estimates doesn't prove anything uh, as long as you're, you know, within the realm of possibility. Uh, so that's number one. And uh, issue number two is uh, to, um, uh, to, there was another one and there are more questions still. Um, yeah, Dave, I think we need to hit oh, the grant. Uh, yeah, the grant, uh, the uh, grant writer's grant. Uh, Jamie Matos will be uh, in touch with all the applicants and tell you whether we'll reserve a grant from for you we will not res you know we will tell you that we've accepted your application but we do not reserve a grant writer's grant and we have finite number of uh, funds until you have gone through pre-qualified in grants gateway that that helps us determine that you're serious on getting this done exactly all right thank you everybody please reach out to your rsms if the RSMs can, you know, need to get more technical advice, they'll loop you to myself, David, Jamie, Jeremy as needed. But definitely your first step is through your regional security manager. All right, everybody, best of luck. There's a lot of openings. We advise if you get to the finish line you likely and are eligible, you likely will be awarded this grant is my personal uh, advice. So good luck to you guys. You got to be in it to win it and you have to be in it seriously not just purchasing a ticket. You have to do some work here. Thanks everybody.